the body and out again at radio frequency rates again causing heat. So when we talk about radio frequency, we must remember we have, are talking about different things. Now we've done a lot of work looking at the LED. Do remember with linear end of units energy density, a lot of people think this is restricted only to um, laser, but in fact, you can use it for any sort of uh, end of units energy or thermal ablation. And we use the poor side liver model. And what we've shown is if you use the sorts of powers that people used to talk about, where you use high powers, but very quickly, you get inadequate burns. And if you slow it down to high power to try and get a better penetration of the heat, all that ends up happening is you get charcoal. And we published this, if you want to read this, Badham, who is one of my uh, research fellows and myself published this in Phlebology. And what we showed is when we looked at the original bipolar RFITT device, if you want to get your burn out to about 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 of a millimeter, which means the whole of the vein wall, if you use the company recommended 80 or 20 watts and pull it back at one centimeter per second, uh, so one second per centimeter, which is what was in the uh, European paper, you don't get adequate closure. In other words, what happens is you only burn about three quarters of the way across the wall. And that's why they had a reopening rate of, nine, uh, of uh, 8% and only a closure of 92%. And of course, they had to exclude the bad results just to get that. However, if you use the same device, but you just decrease the powers slowly, you get the same LED. But what you do is you take longer to pull it back. You get much better trans, uh, transmural uh, energy transfer all the way. Even when you get to 72 uh, LED, you can keep the same LED, but by reducing power and doing, taking it longer, you can get different biological effects. And this is a really important thing to remember. So is this just theory or does it work? Well, we did some ex vivo human, uh, the great Savinus vein work. And this is a control vein here. This one over here was six watts, giving us uh, 12 seconds per centimeter, um, 72 joules uh, per centimeter is the LED, totally six watts for 12 seconds per centimeter, you multiply those together and you have death of the whole vein wall. Whereas if you use the company recommended 18 watts to try and get the same LED, you have to slow it down to four seconds per centimeter, which still only burns the intima. And more than that, you get charcoalization. So the same LED gives different biological results depending on how fast you pull it back and what power. And this is what I published in our Advances in Phlebology and Venus Surgery book, showing that when you talk about LED, it's inadequate just to talk about the LED itself. Each one of these lines is an LED. For instance, this blue line here, this is 60 LED. So 60 watts at one second per, per centimeter, or 30 watts at two seconds per centimeter, or 20 watts at three seconds per centimeter, you can get the same LED for different powers and different pullbacks, judging by this graph. And of course, we don't want to get charcoal. And so if we don't want to get charcoal, we don't want to go over about 15 watts. If we don't want to, we don't want to pull back more than about 12 seconds per centimeter. We don't want to have a, we don't want to go under a certain LED or else we won't close the vein at all. And we won't want too much pain. So because of that, we have only a certain number of LEDs that will actually close our veins. So whenever you write a paper or you write some notes on a patient, whenever you ever use the LED, you must quote which power you used or which pullback, or else you're not actually making an adequate note. Nobody can see exactly which one of these different points you use or even a point out over here. So remember, when you write an LED, use the power or pullback. Now, last week we had an excellent talk um, by Ravel uh, Jindral from India about laser. And I'm not going to go through that again because he really gave a masterclass on lasers. And just to point out that the different lasers, as we know, have different chromophores. So the 1470 really interacts with water, whereas the 810 interacts with hemoglobin or melanin. But of course, that endovenous work is the, uh, is the um, hemoglobin we're looking at. So we developed an ex vivo model where we harvested the extrafascial great venous vein or dominant tributary if you prefer. We tied it either end of a solution where we had a culture medium inside it, passed lasers or radio frequency, whatever we were looking at into this. 
We then put adrenaline and lignocaine over it so that it looked exactly the same as the um, uh, looked exactly the same as what we would get inside the body. Now, some people have been putting blood into this as well, but in patients we've been measuring, in fact, our patients are 15 degrees head down with a lot of tumescence. And when we've done ultrasound, there is no blood flow in that vein at all. So therefore, this is this represents our practice. If you use a flat table, it may not represent yours, but this is the sort of standard way of exsanguinating a vein. When we then looked at endovenous laser, we first of all looked at 8, 10 nanometers versus 14, 17 nanometers. And this is just the MSB staining. And in MSB staining, blue is normal and red shows fibrosis. Now, as we can see over here in the control, we have normal vein. If the 810 nanometer, 60 joules per centimeter, and that's 10 watts, you can see very little change over here at all. However, when we go up to, when we do the 1470, at exactly the same LED at 10 watts again, you can see you get a good burn, although because it's end firing, a little asymmetric. We then looked at immunocytochemistry because it's one thing to say you have fibrosis, but what you really want to know is do you have destruction? So we then used a, a smooth muscle antigen. And what this shows is this stains for smooth muscle that is still living at the point when the vein was sectioned. So this is control with lovely smooth muscle, all brown stains all the way through, right out to the media, right from the intima out to the media and out to the tissue. At 40, all of these were done at 10 watts. At 40 joules per centimeter, you can see quite a lot of disruption here at eight to 10 nanometers. So even though the MSB didn't show much, we can see disruption and a bit more disruption here at 60 joules per centimeter. Again, 10 watts. But look at the difference for the 1470, complete destruction and the disorientation of all the fibers all the way out, um, both at 40 watts and also 60 watts. And at 60 watts, we can see almost going through the vein wall over here. Now, if we look at the C3 staining, when we're looking at cells, cells are either necrosed and die straight away. That's like having an egg and just boiling it. It's the proteins or denature and they're dead straight away or they're injured and they're going to die within 24 to 48 hours. And when that happens, it's a process called apoptosis. And apoptosis we can look at by looking at when the caspase C3 is expressed. When that's expressed, that cell will definitely die. Now, when we look in the control, there's a little bit of apoptosis out over here, and that's just because of handling the vein, but the rest of the vein is quite healthy and alive. At the 810 nanometers at 40 joules per centimeter, we can see a lot of this brown staining apoptosis around here, and even more when we go to 60 joules per centimeter right to the outside. So although we don't see huge amounts of necrosis on the other stains with, uh, for the 810 nanometer laser, we do still get a closure, as Min showed us many years ago, because of apoptosis more than necrosis. Now in the 1470, you don't see any of it. And the reason is that vein is already dead. As you saw on the SMA in the last slide, these cells are already dead, they're necrosed, and so therefore they don't express caspase C3. So what's the difference between a jacket tip and a radial tip in the EVLA? So if we use 1470 nanometers on the same and the same powers, but the, just the only difference being the tips, you can see on the MSB control here on the left, in the middle, this is what we get with the jacket tip. It's eccentric. You've got carbonization here, which leads to pain. It's over to the side. And if that actually goes through, of course, we'll get your ecchymosis or bruising. Whereas the radial tip, look at that. There you get a lovely symmetrical uh, burn all the way around. And so it's very homogeneous. And this is exactly what you'd expect. Again, if you want to look at that, the SMA, we see the same fibers here. This is uh, the same pattern, rather. This is the control. Uh, 40 joules per centimeter, 10 watts, uh, some disruption with forward firing fiber and more at 80. And again, the same over here on the radio. And once again, over here, you can see once we get up to 80 joules per centimeter, we've got charcoal and we've almost got penetration through the wall. Sorry. Uh, whereas if we actually look at the radial at the same 80 joules per centimeter, we've got total transmural death. That vein is definitely going to go away. Um, but we have absolutely no charcoal at all that we can see and certainly no risk of uh, perforating. 
Um, if we look at the uh, alpha uh, P53, this is the precursor. This is the thing just before caspase C3, so it's almost the same. It is possible for a cell to come back from uh, expressing phosphorylated P53 and not go to C3, but not really in veins, it's rare. So we can look at this as if it was C3. Again, in the control, there's a couple of cells showing this because we've handled it. And again, forward firing, we can see quite a lot um, of uh, the P53 expressed. And when we get to the 80 joules per centimeter, the area of the vein where it almost came through the wall is completely necrosed. There's absolutely none of the brown staining over here. But on the other side, which wasn't dead, it's going to die because of apoptosis. So at 80 joules per centimeter, we're still going to get a good result, but just in a less refined way and charcoal formation, which is wasting energy. Whereas with the radial fibers, we get a bit of apoptosis at 40 joules per centimeter at 10 watts, but we get total death at, uh, at 80 joules per centimeter, which is, sticks with what we know clinically. Now, when we compare that radio frequency, we find that well, there's a slight difference in the actual pattern, but the reality is, it's almost the same. Good radio frequency, when it's applied to the vein wall, will give you the same amount of apoptosis and cell death as a radial laser. So what else is new and what can, what can we take this, knowing now roughly what we're looking for? We're looking for apoptosis or necrosis, and we're looking for transmural death. We've got the endovenous microwave, which has come from Echo in China, and we can see we've got a very, very similar pattern of uh, destruction as we have with the other endovenous thermal ablation. The one thing is with this is it is a true electromagnetic microwave and radio frequency, it's not contact. And so just like as you beam into your chicken or whatever you're cooking in your microwave at home, this actually heats the tissue away. So like laser, you don't have to be in contact with the, with the actual wall of the vein. So this is laser and microwave, you don't have to be in contact with the same as steam. With, micro, with radio frequency, that's the one you have to have some contact with the vein wall. Uh, we did the microwave, as you all know, and we were very fortunate one of our celebrities decided to have this and then went for a run, a uh, nine kilometer run the next day, which uh, was not what we recommended, but it, he's got a good result. Now, when it comes to sclerotherapy, what we all know from what's been published before, um, Ken Myers over, wrote uh, some time ago in the, uh, from, Canada, uh, from Australia, and we all know that sclerotherapy works better in small veins than in big veins. And we tried to work out why that was, although we thought we knew already. And we tried these different stains, which didn't help until we went to immunocytochemistry. When we use immunocytochemistry, we can use fluorescent antibodies here, the red ones for the endothelium, CD31, and alpha-actin here, the green ones, showing the living smooth muscle cells. The blue flecks are the nuclei. That's a healthy vein wall. After 3% SDS, you can see what happens. The, this living healthy wall, we destroy a lot of the endothelium, we destroy a lot of the vein wall. But when we actually then look at it in 50 micron aliquots, this is endothelium, CD31, and this is coming out here away from the wall. And we can see that by the time we're getting into about 200 microns, there is no further death. So this is only transmural death if the vein wall is less than 200 microns. In other words, it's not the small vein that matters, it's the thin vein wall of small veins, which means this is why our radiologist colleagues tell us that they can use foam in venous abnormalities, even when it's 50 or 60 millimeters, because they have very thin walls. So we must get away from talking about vein diameter, and we must talk about vein thickness. And this is just a bit more proof of how it works. The P53 and also the ICAM-1 inflammation showing in a normal vein here and showing once again that both the apoptosis and the, vein and the um, inflammation, cellular inflammation are both show the same pattern out to about 200 microns. So this is why we shouldn't be using foam in our truncal veins unless we have some special way of doing it because it doesn't really work and we don't get transmural death. But in small veins, it's excellent. So this is where, again, uh, published in our book recently, thick wall veins, if you only use foam sclerotherapy and only get intimal death and don't work out some way of getting uh, media death, you will get recanalization, which is what we see in the studies. Whereas in the small vein walls, you actually get transmural death and fibrosis. So it's the same sort of idea. How does MOCA work then, Clarivane or the new Flebergriff? And the reason that works is because you're actually ripping the vein wall. 
And this is histology showing this. We won a prize at the American College of Pathology for this work, showing that in the normal vein wall here, not only do you get endothelial damage, which people will talk about, but you actually get media damage here from the, the shearing stress of turning the inside of the vein against the outside. And this acts like a Swiss cheese, so the sclerosin can get deep into the vein wall, and that way your 200 microns starts from deep in the vein wall. This is your normal uh, surface uh, sclerotherapy here, and this is what happens when you've used mocha. And once again, when you actually look at this, you can see this significant increase of cell wall death after mocha, and also increased depth of endothelium, right out to about 400, 500 microns, which is why Claravane works in truncal veins much better than foam alone. With glue, we can't talk too much about it because we did some work under an NDA, um, but it does damage the endothelium and then it damages, it works in a completely different way. You do get um, transmural death, but from a foreign body reaction, it's not a cell death. And I don't really want to talk too much more about that because we did it under an NDA and we're repeating the work ourselves. This is the latest thing, the high intensity focused ultrasound. It's got two components. The first is the ultrasound to image, and this is what the image looks like on the right. And this is the great saphenous vein here in the fascia with the skin at the top. And this is just a little bit of local anesthetic, both localize it so we can see it. It's an awful lot less. It's about a tenth of the amount to a twentieth of the amount of volume that we'd use for tumescence. Then you fire the high foo, the high intensity focus ultrasound, and this dome here focuses all the ultrasound to one point. And that point's about five millimeters high and 3.5 millimeters across. You see this pattern on the right hand side and where the bubbles are formed from the thermoablation actually in the tissue, you get a reflection and you don't from the local anesthetic either side. And immediately afterwards, you see this vein here, and this is an ablated vein. When you see that picture, you know that that vein is ablated. And what, how does that, well, we're coming up with some histology at the moment, and I don't have that to show you yet because we haven't published it, um, but we're starting to work on it. But basically this is what happens. As a high food comes in and goes out, you get this zone of destruction. And the beautiful thing of this, and what's different about HIFU than any of the other techniques I've talked about, is all of the other techniques start at the intima and have to work their way out. And so all the physics we look at in biology is how do we get the destruction from the intima to the outside? It's, got, it's a combination of power and time. The lovely thing with HIFU is you're actually already putting that energy right across from adventitia to intima and from intima to adventitia all at one go. And this is why I'm so excited about this as a sort of form of thermal ablation. Not the fact, I mean, the fact it's non-invasive is even better, it's from outside the body. But the, but the biology of it is very elegant because we should get fibrosis in evolution. I can't believe that we won't get excellent results. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Omar and Dr. Eamon again for inviting me, but uh, I think this is what my, I've sort of done for the last 20 years. And I think the most important thing is never cut a vein if you can help it and never expose the endothelium. Try always to get transmural death of the vein wall. And I don't mind if you use chemicals, if you use heat, whatever you use, as long as the biological principles work. Don't get thrombus inside if you're going to leave any living media or adventitia or even uh, endothelium, because that's the disaster for getting your regrowth. If you use thermoablation, remember, it's not only the power that's important, you also have to not have an optimal time of application. So understand your biology and physics as well when you're getting the best results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is very interesting talk and really I think it will deviate uh, our thoughts to many things. Uh, as you uh, told us, uh, the transmural death uh, depends on the vein uh, wall thickness. And I think uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Erwin uh, Tudner from Netherlands. Uh, do you think, Dr. Erwin, uh, in your uh, practice and in doing duplex, do you think you have to pay more attention for the vein wall thickness after this uh, lecture? <laughs> With ultrasound to look at the vein wall, uh, it's not really that relevant. So, uh, 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 thank you very much, Mark. I found it a wonderful presentation as usual. Uh, uh, but what we should realize, and I think that he made a very relevant point when we we're talking about the lead. If I was to say, because I saw one of the questions regarding nerve damage, but if you were performing your, uh, your, your endovenous thermal ablation, whatever technique you're using, 
Um, if you were to protect the nerve, Mark, would you say, if you were to use a, an energy of, say, a, a lead of 60, would you go for the, the short term, six second, 10 watt, or would you go for the slower 10 second, six watt? Because that's the kind of discussion that people would try and say to prevent nerve damage, even if they're using the, the same lead, which people are using in publications and causing this misunderstanding because they say, we're only using 60, and we're not getting any nerve damage. And then you're looking at the wattage and then you're saying, yes, well, how come this guy does have nerve damage? What would your preference be if you were treating the small saphenous vein? Uh, that's right. an, as always, that's an excellent question. And I think the most important thing we should always be trying to do is we should think about the physics in whole. And so you want to use the highest power you can use that's going to give you a transmural death because that way it is the highest power be the shortest possible and you'll get less spread towards a nerve. So obviously we want to try and push the nerve away with tumescence. I don't believe that works with skin by the way, but for nerves it does because it's short term. You push it away um, in the short term, you use the highest possible power. So I'd use the 10 watts and six seconds, not the six watts and 10 seconds, but also do remember the other point that's very, very important. You've also got to think about the length of power because if you've got a radial laser or microwave that's sort of like two millimeter ring or maybe one centimeter, the zone of heating is actually not very far. But if you're putting a seven centimeter device up that is 120 degrees centigrade, you're gonna get much more thermal spread. And so it's not just the power and the time in that case, it's also the length of application. And so we have to, we have to always think in three dimensions with this. So power, time, and also what the source is what the shape is for the expansion of the heat. So that's why I personally, we, we, um, I don't know if we had published in the end, but at one stage we did look at using segmental ablation in the small sphenous vein and found, yes, it's successful if you use the right LED, et cetera, but um, the, the risk of um, loss of sensation, you know, even transit was much higher. So, so that's why we, we moved away from that. But yes, I mean, it all, at the end of the day, it all comes down to physics, right? So uh, it's always that. So the highest possible, uh, highest possible power, shortest possible time without getting charcoal. Yes. Well, uh, sorry to, to uh, avoid the question about looking with ultrasound at the, the venous wall, but I don't think, you know, uh, when it comes to ultrasound that we're going to add anything. I think the mapping, as Erica explained, is far more important. I think, well, I, I think actually you probably might do it subconsciously in any case. And I know that we did some early work and then of course, Nikos Lavropopoulos did a really lovely study showing that in fact, you can look uh, with ultrasound. And I mean, if you have a very thick vein wall, if you've got a 10, centim a 10 millimeter vein, but it's got a very thickened wall, you're probably going to use a higher LED for that point. You probably can slow down or use a bit more to the temperature. Whereas if you had a very thin blowout, you might not. So you might be doing something consciously just on the look of it i mean at the moment if you're using we, we the leds we're using aren't precise enough to worry too much because we're all over treating a bit to get good results but i think you know at the same day the same way you know it's just a mass of cells that we're heating in the same way that when we want to cook a steak or a chicken you know we will weigh it first and know how much energy we're going to put in so that's that it really does get important if we wanted to get to the pure science but Mark, if, uh, if I look at a vasospasm, you'll have a thick wall and I wouldn't think that you would be tempted to, to adapt your power if you get a vasospasm just because you see a thick wall. You know? uh, but you're not seeing a thick wall with vasospasm. What you're seeing is seeing a normal wall in a vasospasm. And that's why I argue with the, the back in the days of foam sclerotherapy when people said, uh, you can use uh, the foam sclerotherapy works in a three millimeter vein, but it doesn't work in a 10 millimeter vein. So just make the patient cold. And of course, that's ridiculous because in that case, a three millimeter vein into the vasus spasm is a 10 millimeter vein out of the vasus spasm. So that's yeah. where we have to think about the difference. You know, what are we talking about is vein wall versus diameter. So if, if you if you are getting to a thick wall, but only in vasus spasm, you know, either measure it then and work out what it would have been, but, but the key to it always is going to come down to what's the thickness of the wall. I'm okay, Mark. Dr. Suat Duganji, uh, yeah. who, did a, who did a paper on, on uh, uh, small softness vein treatment on, uh, on related to nerve damage. What do you think of the, the, the 